have to really escalate the noise we make so that we'll be heard. Welcome to Gay USA. I'm Andy Hum, and what a week it's been. But we are without Ann Northrup this week, but we are bringing more voices to the table. We're going to start off with Rachel B. Tiven, who is the CEO of the Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund. Right. Welcome. Thank you. You started nice there. You start. Uh, uh, we're, we're going to get into that. We're going to have an, we're going to have another panel at the end of the show of activists. But we want to we want to talk to you about all the things that are happening legally. You started this job at Lambda, the oldest. LGBT legal group in the country uh, in July of 2016 uh, when you w things were looking pretty good then and uh, what are they looking like now to you? Well, I, you know, I, I was I was hired in May. I started in July, and on November eighth, I got a different job. You sure did. Um, and we should say that you're also the former director of the uh, Immigration Equality. Yeah. So we, we, we can talk about all these issues yes. to, today. Yes. Uh, all right. So we're overwhelmed with assaults on human rights, including LGBT rights. What is the top focus of Lambda Legal Defense now? Our top focus is we're not going back. Right. I mean, what's crucial is for people to understand that we did not come this far and work as hard as we all have and get to the point that we're at with nationwide marriage equality supported by the vast majority of Americans. Right. I mean, I think the, the achievement is not just that we won on marriage equality, but the achievement is that the whole country celebrated with us and that most Americans, right, by poll after poll after poll, most Americans know who LGBT people are, believe we should be treated equally, and don't think that that is a particularly controversial thing to think, right? And that's really the, the frame that we're working in. It, this is, right, we, we, are not, we are not alone, right, the four or five percent of us, maybe seven percent among millennials, uh, right, but, but still a, a small group of uh, ourselves, but the vast, vast, vast support from our friends, our families, and, and, and most people in the country is really, that's, that's who cares what happens to LGBT people in this administration. And I, and I think that's true across the country, even in some of the states where, which are fairly right wing, and yet right. they have a lot of power now, right. and they're trying to use it against us. So what, I mean, you know, especially this administration. Right, right. I think, I mean, I think another important frame to keep in mind is this isn't 2004, right? LGBT issues were not on the ballot anywhere in the United States except in one place, North Carolina, and we won. I mean, the governor's race. The governor's race, right? Yes. First time a sitting governor of North Carolina has ever been turned out of office, and he was turned out of office because he went to war against trans and queer people. Right, so that was the only place in the country that w where the election was squarely about LGBT rights. And, and so, you know, and that's a big contrast, right, to where we were, you know, just over a decade ago, where, where hatred of LGBT people was, you know, right, was, was red meat for, you know, for, for one party. Right. So I think it's important to keep in mind that, right, we were not the target, right, we were not the target of, 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 of this election, and yet we're getting hit. Right. right. We 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 are we are going to be hurt by this administration, and people who voted, right, who voted for a kind of economic populism, are going to get along with racism and xenophobia. They're getting a really big dose of homophobia right. from this administration. Right. And uh, starting with the um, new Attorney General of the United States, Jeff Sessions, right. and uh, the Education Secretary Betsy DeVos who will not defend transgender student rights in this Texas case, right. uh, which that's a reversal. The United States was on our side. Now they're not on our side. Right. So how do we preserve those gains for transgender students, uh, which were issued by the Obama administration, or can we right. in, in this case? Right. Well, I think one of the things that's really important to keep in mind is those gains rest on the Constitution and the Civil Rights Act. Right? So the guidance that the Obama administration provided to schools all over the country was, number one, helpful to those schools, and number two, really a tremendous boost to trans people and, and their friends and families 
to say, right, your government sees you. We see you, we care about you, we have your back. And, and deliberately yanking that and changing course is nasty, and it attacks the most vulnerable kids in school. But it doesn't change the law. So how is that going to play out now, uh, that the, the guidance was challenged? I mean, are, if they withdraw the guidance and they mm -hmm. say, this is no longer our guidance, right. our guidance right. is, you know, get a birth certificate before you go to the bathroom. They can withdraw the guidance, but they can't change the underlying law, right? Title IX of the Civil Rights Act says you can't discriminate against kids in school based on sex. It's the same law that provided girls the opportunity to participate in athletics, right? right. That, that's Title IX, and the reason that girls get to play sports in America today is because Title IX said you can't give the boys something that you don't give the girls. Right. And sex discrimination in school is against the law. And that, that covers, right, if you're, if you're persecuting a kid because of their sex, it's against the law. That's what the Gavin Grimm case is about. That's what our case in Pittsburgh is about. That's what Transgender Law Center's case in Wisconsin is about, right? There's a, there, there, are, there, are, there are cases all over the country, but there's really clear case law that says that discriminating against trans people and trans kids is against the law under the Civil Rights Act, and no, the administration does not get to change that. And, of course, states around the country are trying to pass more anti-transgender laws uh, as, as we sit here, and we'll talk about that. Um, you uh, have posted on your website your 2017 defense plan, love Trump's hate, and you say we're not going back. But uh, one of the things uh, the Trump administration seems to want to do, and it seems to be moving towards, or said that they want, is the First Amendment Defense Act, which is going to allow uh, p people especially who work for the federal government and agencies funded by the federal government to right. be allowed to discriminate if they, right. as they right. will based on religious, their religious convictions. What are your hopes for taking these things on or if he does an executive order on this? We're, gonna, we, we're really working on two tracks, right? One is the core of what Lambda brings to the, the people of this country, right? Lambda Legal, we are the lawyers for the LGBT community and the opportunity to protect ourselves is in the court system, right? We're seeing that in the immigration and refugee and Muslim ban cases, right? It is the judicial branch that today is going to protect the Constitution because Congress and the White House are attacking the Constitution. Mm. Uh, so Lambda will litigate Right? We have, we have litigation ready to go as soon as there is a direct attack, uh, and we'll talk about what that timing looks like. Um, but the other piece is, right, is, to, is to educate all of us about what, what does it mean to give some people a, an invitation to discriminate, right? What does it mean to say, we're gonna take some religious beliefs and give them an invitation to discriminate as they wish, and other religious beliefs are going to be disfavored, right? That's really what this is about. Right, and uh, one of the people who's one of the biggest uh, proponents of that is Neil Gorsuch, who has made the statement that this is the nominee, Trump's nominee for the United States Supreme Court. Uh, there's articles in the paper that he's got gay friends, uh, you know, and you, you were quoted in that. You can talk about that. Um, but on religious freedom, he says, well, you know, it's the unpopular religious beliefs that need the most protection. And I wonder, what are the limits of that? I mean, there are religions that believe in human sacrifice, and I'm not making a joke. You know, what, what he's very dangerous in this area, isn't he? You know, I th we, we, we are very, very concerned. Lambda Legal, for the first time, is opposing yeah. a Supreme Court nominee even before the hearings uh, because we are so concerned that his stance on a, a, a kind of infinite claim to the free exercise of religion uh, is really becomes a kind of established state religion, yeah. right? That's what we're seeing, is that this is essentially the establishment of Christian fundamentalism as the state religion. It makes those beliefs more equal than others, particularly, right, and what we're seeing in these leaked drafts from the White House and, and the campaign, what we're seeing in the First Amendment Defense Act, although it really should be called the Fostering American Discrimination <laughs> Act, okay. uh, right, what we're right. seeing is that if your religious beliefs are that you hate gay people and you think transgender people don't exist, you are hereby invited to use that prejudice to, to, to spend tax dollars to, to advance that prejudice. Right. 
and and that it's just it's a violation of the separation of church and state it's a violation of the first amendment which has been breaking down for a long time the wall of separation i mean even here in new york we fund a lot we we fund a lot of religious groups that you know sign a little piece of paper saying they don't discriminate but then they work against gay rights and things like that this is all over the country Uh, and then and then the president says i want to get rid of this johnson amendment which says that uh uh, stops churches from making uh, explicit endorsements and and races so they're going to be able to use our money to do this exactly i mean what is right what's so troubling is that what we're seeing is that is that that fundamentalist christian religious groups want to have it both ways right they want a tax deduction for contributions but they want the right to endorse candidates which you're not allowed right you're Right. You are not in. It. No, nobody else gets that. Would this mean Lambda right? can start endorsing candidates too? Well, I, it, 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 it <laughs> would certainly it, it would certainly open the door for me right? because the the opening of the door to anybody yeah. who claims a religious motivation, even a private company. This was in the Hobby Lobby circumstance, right? Gets to gets gets really a free pass to discriminate. So they want to have it both ways in two ways that I think are really interesting, right? It's both sort of taking taking tax deductions, but but acting like a like a non exempt non tax deduction organization yeah. right but also they want they want to take taxpayer money and use it to discriminate yeah. and that's I mean right that that's that that's really it's 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 hypocrisy you get a donation for it now, now talk about lambda and lambda's role in all this you you say you're step you're opening up an office in Washington you're stepping up your help desk talk to our viewers about how they can access what what you have and how they can feed into it sure well we are we're really putting resources out there all the time our FAQs right immediately after the election frequently, the frequently, asked, the frequently questions. asked questions I think everybody uh, that we yeah. that we put together right to answer people's very you know very urgent very potent questions you know is my marriage safe should I get married if I'm not married um, as a trans person what can I do to protect myself um, you know, right? What, I mean, th- these these were questions that we were getting, uh, you know, in droves, and and really proud to be able to put accurate legal resources out immediately, so that people have access to correct information. I mean, right? What Lambda Legal is about is really being the best lawyers for the LGBT community and for everybody living with HIV. Right. And that, you know, so to to cut misinformation and put real information out there, people can contact our help desk and call the help desk. Uh, and, and, and reach the help desk through lambdalegal.org backslash help. And you can get help on a huge range of LGBT and HIV related legal questions. Right. Uh, our job is to provide accurate, respectful, free information to anybody who contacts us for help and to point people in the right direction of what they do next. And in some cases, we take a case from the help desk if it is a case that really has particularly uh, potent uh, p- potential to impact the rest of right. the country. We should say that you're not a legal services organization in that right. sense. So you don't just take any case right. that happens to be LGBT. Although you used to work in legal services yourself, I, I, you have that, I did. Those I started. Roots. I started as a legal aid lawyer, uh, working and representing immigrants with the Legal Aid Society of New York. But you're looking for when it comes to taking cases, you're looking for precedent-setting cases that are going to help the whole right. all all right. LGBT. Right. And people. that is something that Neil Gorsuch has attacked. Yes. Right, Neil Gorsuch has specifically said that he is troubled by the yeah. use of impact litigation, particularly in the LGBT context, to vindicate the rights of minorities. I, I, you know, g- given g- given the, the state of the U.S. Congress, I'm not sure exactly how else uh, he expects us to, to to advocate for our rights. Well, so Gorsuch is is would be if he is confirmed would be replacing Scalia, who was against us. Uh, but that still gives us a five four pro LGBT majority with Anthony Kennedy. But if one of those eighty year olds leaves and Trump or Pence at this point gets to replace uh, uh, him or her, um, then. Where are we? I mean, you've got three justices who were very against uh, the the marriage decisions. They right. thought they were right. a joke. Right. They were critical, or they ridiculed them in some cases. Right. And if you get two more, right. things can be reversed. Well, look, I think it's or no. I, I, well, I think you look at look at how hard it was to reach the achievement in the first place, and and that's how hard it is to undo it. Right, so something like guidance from the Justice Department, the Department of Education, that promotes the rights of transgender students in schools, you know, it, it, easy come, easy go, right? 
Marriage equality, a 20-year effort, started at Lambda Legal by Evan Wolfson in Hawaii and then carried through many, many, many people working all over the country, state by state, right? And 20 years yes. of very, very, very passionate effort. Yes. That's right. What we put into that achievement is, is, you know, is an indicator of how hard it would be to roll it back. And I think the other thing that's important is civil rights decisions, right? Crucial decisions by the United States Supreme Court, Brown versus Board of Education, Roe versus Wade, were greeted with far more, more uh, you know, ambivalence, ambivalence is putting it mildly, right? At the time that they, right, right. I mean, compared to people cheering in the streets and the White House lit in rainbow right. colors. Okay. You know, that, I mean, right, that it's not just that it's hard to undo a precedent, it's that Americans broadly support marriage equality and LGBT rights. Americans broadly support some uh, right to abortion, uh, but that could be lost and they seem to be determined to do it. Uh, they certainly are determined and one of the things that we are trying to make sure is that is that if what we don't have from this administration Right. If we don't have a full frontal attack, right? If there isn't an executive order that attacks LGBT people, or an executive order that says you have a free pass to discriminate if you claim yeah. a, any religious belief of any kind or any moral belief, right? If we don't get that, we're going to fight a kind of drip, 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 chipping away of our rights in the manner of these religious exemptions or the exclusion of public accommodations from civil rights laws in different states or locales, right? I mean, that's the kind of thing that, right, what, what, we, what we see from the challenges of protecting the right to your own body and the right to have an abortion is that, right, that sometimes it's not, it's not a repeal of your, of your signature case. It's a, it's, it's a chipping away from underneath. And that's really why Lambda Legal's work in five regional offices and now in Washington and really working all across the country is so necessary. And go to lambdalegal.org to find out where there's an office near you or you can always call them on, on their telephone. Uh, I, don't wanna, oh, I don't want you to leave without talking about yeah. immigration and I don't know how much that is a focus sure. for, for Lambda, but that was your expertise at immigration equality. What are you thinking about what's going on with uh, immigration right now and the attacks on it uh, and what can be done, especially as it affects the LGBT community, right. detention, especially for transgender people, right. all these kinds of things. Right, right. It's brutal. And, you know, and it's it's been brutal a long time. Um, I mean, painfully, for as beautifully embracing and articulate as the Obama administration was about LGBT issues, uh, right, with the exception of deferred action, uh, they were brutal. They were, the Obama administration detained and deported more people than the past than the four prior administrations put together and kept children and their mothers in jail in Texas um, I went down there and I've seen those those facilities with my own eyes and and they did it uh, with no shame so now things are much worse so now things are much worse <laughs> but Americans are awake to it okay. right so I mean I think that the that, that, that the opportunity to protect, our friends and neighbors, our colleagues, our classmates, uh, is, is, you know, is, 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 the question has been called, right? Will we, will we stand up for the communities that we live in? And so far, I, I think, I think people are responding and, and that gives me a lot of hope. Well, so the last thing I'll ask you as we move into our activist panel, but we're all activists here, all of us. Um, is uh, y y mobilizing your base, all these people yeah. that, that, that yeah. are members of Lambda, yep. they you know, sign yep. on, all those kinds of things, as activists to get them to do, is that something that's on your agenda? I think it's gonna be a much bigger part of our agenda than it ever has been before. Um, it's still not, right, I mean, we, we're, we're not, uh, you know, we're not grassroots organizers. I, I, I happily leave that to many, our many wonderful peer organizations. But we have a huge base, right? right? I mean, through through social media, uh, through our lists on, online, um, we really can mobilize, uh, you know, more than a half a million people uh, who care passionately about equality for LGBT people and the health and well-being of people living with HIV. And, you know, that's a force. That's so, a real force. Well, Lambda Legal was founded 44 years ago. Almost 44. And yeah. uh, never perhaps needed more than it is right now today. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, Thank Rachel. You. Nice to be here. And lambdalegal.org is the place to go for more information.
we're moving into our activist panel now, and we're showing you a picture of Michael Petrellis, the San Francisco activist who was out there um, when the Ninth Circuit made its decision on the travel ban of, of Trump was overturned. There he was with a Trump pinata, showing you how you can be an activist, even on your own, if you're creative, and et cetera. But we, uh, I've rolled up my sleeves for this uh, section of the program, and uh, we have a wonderful group of activists here to talk about activism in the age of Trump. And I'm going to let you introduce yourselves. Great. Um, I'm Jeremiah Johnson. I'm the HIV Prevention Research and Policy Coordinator at Treatment Action Group here in New York. I'm also a co-founder of a new activist organization that you'll hear about today called Rise and Resist. Hi, I'm Leah Hennessy. I'm also a member of Rise and Resist, and I'm here as the novice millennial activist with very little experience and a lot of passion. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Gibbs, and I'm an activist and an attorney, and I'm semi-retired. Uh, so the focus of my work but since my retirement has been on illegal observing and representation of activists who've been arrested okay. or, and others. And that is my first question uh, for all of you. What is the focus now, given the, all the assaults that we're feeling, what is the focus of your activism now? Um, you know, I, I think uh, there's a lack of focus that a lot of us are feeling right now because we're being attacked on all sides. Our very system of governance feels like it's being dismantled before our very eyes and so um, right now I, I think a lot of us are just trying to reprioritize the activism that we've been doing around these new threats so on HIV prevention I'm very concerned about dismantling of ACA very concerned about what's going to be happening at the CDC and with Tom Price but I know for Rise and Resist we're trying to take everything on right now until it becomes more clear which way to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah I think there's also for me, and this is just speaking for me personally, I, this, I, this is not a rise and resist statement, but I feel like there's a lot of meta-activism going on. There's a lot of activating people into activism, which is a, a job in itself. Um, so talking to people about everything that's going on, trying to get people to come to meetings, um, talking to people about little things like daily actions and calling your senators and all that stuff but i think that this is a huge seismic shift in the world obviously we're all totally aware and um there's a lot that i feel needs to be done and i hope i'm playing my part in getting getting people turned on to strategies and tactics and ways to get more involved that that aren't so isolating and that go beyond going to protests and Joan, what's your focus beyond your well, legal uh, observing, which you do I so was, well? I uh, wanted to say that, you know, um, Trump and his people, particularly Bannon, thrive on chaos. Yes. And so they're creating chaos. So what I've been doing recently a lot is thinking about prioritize, prioritizing what I'm doing and what is important, which is a difficult thing to do because every day there's something new, right? Yeah. So I was thinking about to prioritize because we also have to remain Mm -hmm. able to continue and yeah. see and with people just keep you know flailing they will burn out or probably be exhausted so that's what I've been doing a lot of thinking about besides legal observing talking to people I mean in terms of the news this week I mean everybody's very excited uh, oh you mm -hmm. know uh, maybe the Trump administration is going to end before it gets started oh, because right. of this Russia <laughs> stuff but that's all they're talking about on the news right now, and it's a perfectly legitimate issue about the takeover of the United States by Russia. But while we're talking about that, and that's 24-hour news, they're dismantling Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, labor laws, reproductive rights, et cetera. How do we get people focused back on what's going on in Washington and what they're doing? Absolutely. How do we do it? Yeah, I mean, no, I, I, you know, I think that's something that we're really focused on. So. Rise and Resist has formed um, a, a, out of a lot of activists with experience in ACT UP, which of course um, has this great legacy of, of um, healthcare activism uh, that stemmed out of 
uh, the Reagan administration's neglect of people living with HIV AIDS back in the 80s. And so we know a lot about trying to gain attention to issues that are happening under the radar. And I think one of the main threats that we have, um, you know, for, for people living with HIV right now, for people with pre-existing conditions in America is what the Republicans are doing in the meantime with the Affordable Care Act and what's sort of happening behind the scenes of all of these other headline catching problems we're seeing just this morning, Paul Ryan was on MSNBC mm -hmm. promising uh, that they would take away protections around pre-existing conditions uh, for, for getting coverage through insurance. That's a huge issue for people living with HIV. So I think it's our job um, within Rise and Resist uh, to try and call attention to those things that aren't making it in the media right now. And I think also, uh, it's not only that, but people have to be able to link and, and make coalitions with people, yes. right? Because it, the fact of the matter is, most people, I mean, my, Andy and my age, and some younger than us, have a pre-existing condition. Yeah. And they're not necessarily, you know, they're not HIV positive. So that's the issue that impacts a broad level of people, including young people who might have. I mean, that is an enormous thing yeah. that they're doing, enormously dangerous and deadly thing. So I think we have to, you know, find ways to create coalitions and collaboration with other groups that we might not heretofore have been involved with. And I think right, one of the, I've gone to a couple of Rise and Resist meetings, and that's one of the things I like, because it seemed that that was what was happening in the room, but that could just be my eternal optimism. No. What is it like being in the room of Rise and Resist? What do you see around you? Well, I sometimes feel, I sometimes get a little self-conscious because I walk in the room and I'm so happy. And I, especially if I'm facilitating, I get really excited and I, I walk in with a big smile on my face and I'm so happy to see people and making friends and talking about things that have gone well and saying, oh no, did you hear this horrible new thing that happened two minutes ago and this could, you know, so it's, it is really starting to feel like it sounds corny, but it is starting to feel like of some kind of family, and it is an amazingly effective support network. I think that our greatest days are yet to come in terms of effective and strategic actions. We've had some amazing actions that I think Jeremiah would be better qualified to talk about. But um, to me, our, the future is bright, but what is happening right now is just a real sense of solidarity. And it's still in that honeymoon period of that getting to know you uh, glow, I think, and I, and I, and I. To me, the thing about it is, I don't feel scared when I'm there. And no matter what we're talking about, no matter how horrifying the the reality outside that room that is also inside that room is, I feel, I feel strong with those people. And and I, I think that's, I think I speak on behalf of the group. Is Rise and Resist nationwide or just here in New York? So right now it's just here in New York. We have people interested in starting other chapters, and so we're hoping to to. Um, to expand beyond there, but um, you know we're less than three months old right now. How big are you? When? Where do you meet? So we have about 8,500 people on our Facebook group. So um, go to Facebook, rise and, go to Facebook resist. rise and resist. Um, we're getting regularly three to 400 people coming to our weekly Tuesday meetings, which are usually at the LGBT Center here in Manhattan. And how is it distinguished from things that happened in the past? What What would you say the focus of this group is? So, I mean, the, the focus of, of this group is, is uh, really trying to oppose everything that the Trump administration <laughs> represents. Unfortunately, that's a lot of different sort of oppressive attitudes. Multiple communities are being targeted um, and, and multiple, um, you know, uh, facets of our society are being targeted. So right now we're a very decentralized sort of organization that's fostering leadership for people like Leah, fostering leadership, doing trainings, um, encouraging people to start their own action groups within the organization so that we can adapt as much as needed to the newest threat, the newest headline, um, as well as getting ahead of some of these other things we were talking about. And you're the about. group that went out to uh, pressure Chuck Schumer, right? In the bitter cold, I was there. Uh, it was, I could only last an hour, though. I can't, I, it was unbelievably cold that day. But I mean, it's also to send a message to him, which he says, oh, that's good energy. I, I can take a few brickbats. How do you think he's doing as, as uh, you know, the only center of power that we have against the Trump administration in Washington? other than the courts. Yeah. And How about Schumer. Well, Kristen Gillibrand? 
Well, Kirst, yeah, but he's the minority leader. I know he's the minority leader, but that's not. Oh, no, there are many other senators who because are she's you know, voting our way. But strong, yes, actually, mm -hmm. to my surprise, she's what? She's been pretty strong to my surprise. Kirsten Gillibrand, our, our our junior senator in right. New York. Yes. Yeah. Um, what 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 about that though? Uh, that whole issue of we're out of power. You know, we don't have power in most of the state legislatures. We don't even control the state legislature in New York, right. even right. though we elected a majority right of matter. Democrats. And not that even if you had a, 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 a you know, a majority of Democrats that you're controlling too much either. How much are people in these groups willing to put into getting back power electorally is the question. question. Are we going to do that within the next couple of years or what? I think we have a group, we have a group in Rise and Resist that's working on that and I think that that's definitely not the number one focus of our group, but that group within our group is very strong and has our total support. Yeah, yeah I, I think again, while we don't know what tactics you know are going to work right now, sort of throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. We definitely have two groups. Uh, one that's really focusing on uh, the IDC here in New York, the, the Independent Indi Democratic Indi Caucus, Caucus, which right, is yeah. a group of renegade Democrats yes. who self-deal. Caucus with the Republicans to keep the Republican minority mm -hmm. in power. But now there's a lot more, because of Trump really, there's a lot more uproar about this and we're trying to peel them off. Yes. I want them thrown out of the party. I'm a Democrat. I want them thrown out of the party. They, that You can't take them out of their seat unless you don't elect them. But they shouldn't be able to run yeah. as Democrats yeah. if they vote for a Republican leader. Exactly. And, and so, you know. New York. Exactly. It, here in New York, you know, and we're trying to put pressure on Chuck Schumer also, not one inch. Um, Tim Murphy is doing a lot of work in that group around that. Um, just this notion. What is that? Not one inch. So that's the group that went out in front of yes. uh, Chuck Schumer's uh, 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 apartment building and is trying to sort of corral these Democrats that aren't necessarily um, representing their constituents as strongly as we need them to right now when our checks and balances are under attack and mm -hmm. our federal government here in the state. And that's something that we're focusing on a lot. And uh, what, how about yourself? You said you were you're, you're relatively new to this. Yes. Were you? Did you vote? Uh, do you want to yeah. vote more now? I mean, do you yeah. Wanna... I mean, I'm okay. I mean, I'm. I feel especially in this group, I feel uh, infantile. But I, you know, obviously, I not obviously. I guess. I guess our generation is kind of. Um, I've been, there's a lot of doubts about us. But uh, yes, I voted, and I voted for Bernie, and then I voted for Hillary, and. Um, Me too. And, uh, yeah, and uh, um, you know, I've always been there on that basic level of civic engagement. And uh, what I, after, after the election, I felt, I don't even, you know, I felt blank. I probably felt the same as everyone watching the show, obviously. And the first thing I did was I have training from this, a school called the School of Authentic Journalism. And teaching, what is that? Is it's it? a program led by someone named Al Giordano. He's a former journalist. And it's uh, teaching p activists and organizers and artists like myself. I was in that group, also a non-activist, non-organizer, but I'm a writer and an artist. So teaching people the tools to produce content, to become citizen journalists, and to circumvent um, mainstream media and report on stuff themselves. So after the election, I put on my authentic journalist hat and went out and started interviewing protesters and making little films and just trying to capture that moment in history and also try to part of authentic journalism and I'm not here as a representative of SAJ but part of it is making movement media for the people in movements and helping them tell their story to themselves so that was my first response action and and I enjoy doing that I've made a few films and it, it feels good it's a good way to talk to people it's a good way to be at protests with a camera you have a lot more mobility but I definitely felt the need to be part of a group and to, to even just step up and do service because I know that I can talk. That's one of the things I can do. Well, so. that's what we try to do here at Gay USA. Yeah. I mean, Ann Northrup uh, and I both have journalism backgrounds and, and, and somewhat in the mainstream. And, uh, you know, she worked at CBS Morning News and places in Good Morning America, right. and she said she found eventually that it was, she uses the phrase, intellectually bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And But here, you know, we tell the truth as much as we can, and we're not. I mean, it's not. There's no commercial interests or anything like that. But uh, it's it. You know, I look at places like MSNBC now, and I see them moving to the right, right. and hiring Fox mm. News people, mm. and I worry. So we do have to make our own media. Yeah, yes. I uh, before becoming 
uh, Allure, you're going to law school. I was a journalist. I worked at something called Liberation News Service, which oh, you probably yes. don't oh. you probably don't know about. It was started started by the Student for Democratic Society. And I think that, you know, um, social media is good, but we also need to have uh, written things. Mm. Mm. You know, I mean, of course, Ellen S. was in the day when there was written material, <laughs> written news, when there was pub, uh, publications. I also wrote for The Guardian, which you also probably don't know about, but it was a radical newspaper. So I, you know, and I think that one of the things, the media, it's important to create, you know, provide alternative voices. But Trump has also attacked the mainstream media in a way that's horrifying. Yeah. Like he constantly was listening at, I guess it was MSNBC this morning, or maybe it was Democracy Now. It's talked about, the, he always describes the failing New York Times and Washington right. Post. And, he refer, and Bannon <laughs> says the media is the opposition, the opposition party. party. Right. right. It's the so craziest. it's an interesting, you know. Well, the Village Voice used to be a radical paper and hasn't yeah. really been much but of one in recent better. years. But My look at the cover. For them. Make right. America <laughs> Radical <laughs> Again. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we're, we're laughing, but, but I mean. It's, it's getting it's I thought it was bad. Here's yeah. the thing yeah. we don't have any power. We, right. don't have, we don't have a voice. We don't have much of a voice in Washington. Right. We don't have any levers of power. This is all we have. Right. Yeah. People in the streets. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. my question is, how far do you think people are going to be willing to go? It's, I mean, we're all used to demonstrating, and my <laughs> God, look at all the people who turned out for the Women's March. Right. I mean, everybody, everybody we know. And for more of these marches. But what, are people going to be willing to, civil disobedience, go on a national strike to grind down the people who are grinding us down? Yeah. Well, well, I would just like to say that, you know, talking to protesters, and I tried... In those little films, I tried the, uh, to do as good a job as I could, talking to as many different kinds of people. And you know, obviously, you don't mm -hmm. know how diff who people are just by looking at them, but approaching different looking people at least. And pe a lot of them were total non-activists, uh, very basic understanding of civil disobedience, of of all this stuff we're talking about. And my impression throughout all the protests was that there was not just a feverish, gung ho first responder mania there really was a I'm in this for the long haul I'm gonna do whatever it takes and there's just a yearning for leadership and for solidarity and I think that I think that for people who are willing to be out in the streets and are willing to get arrested or willing to go the distance whatever that means I think that I would encourage those people watching to also, because we, we don't just have people in the streets, we have people meeting before they go on the streets. And I think that's really essential. And people who want to protest should also get into the organizing side of things because showing up is great, but you really are a body in the street. And if you're part of the organization, you amp it's a whole different it's a whole different experience and it's a whole different kind of effectiveness. Yeah, to, I mean, just to, to build off of that, I mean, we're asking people at every uh, Rise and Resist meeting, how many of you are new to activism? How many of you, of you have never done this before? And about half the room is raising their hands. So oh, this, this is something where people are, they're like, I know I need to do something, but I don't know how to. I've never been trained mm -hmm. how to live under an oppressive government. Well, tell America how to do it. <laughs> exactly. You know, and so we're organizing trainings right now. Fortunately, we have a lot of people with experience from ACT UP. Um, uh, Alexis Danzig and Jamie Bauer are organizing trainings around how to be marshals at demonstrations. We're looking into uh, doing uh, legal trainings, which Joan can talk about more. We're looking to do um, more trainings around civil disobedience because the willingness is there and people are starting to recognize just how big of a threat this is. But to take it to that next level of opposition, I think we're, we're training ourselves now and in a few months we're going to have a formidable force to really be much more radical. And what do you think is being most effective? I mean, certainly what happened around the travel ban, mm -hmm. where everybody just turned out at the airports, yeah. you know, and stop and basically helped stop that. Mm -hmm. They brought, they made public officials come down there with them and get these people out of the back room where they were being detained, and they got the lawyers and all that kind of stuff, and we got the courts to act immediately. So, what what are you finding as I, most we, effective? Well, I mean, what I, well historically, I think what's been very effective. Is, are things like boycotts and strikes, mm -hmm. and uh, that article, the article in the, the head um, front page article, well, the article front page on the Voice on the in the Voice this week, focuses on that um, mm -hmm. on strikes. You know, just strikes and the role they played in history. Now, you know, 
people are always calling for general strikes. A general strike requires building up to. Right. It requires. That means, well, to explain stay, what a general strike is. A general strike is when a, a large majority of the people in any one location go out and, you know, s stop, you know, for a day, don't work, don't go to school, don't shop. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think that the call for the strike, the national strikes, are, is very, very interesting. And I think the boycotts have been effective. And they have happened before, yeah, to right. great effect, in right. France and other right. places. Oh, in 68, over the remember centuries. Yeah. the strikes in 19, you yes. probably remember 1968, there was massive strikes all around the world. Well, there was some kind of right. action. I, I didn't even know about it, but until I got in my elevator this morning, the, the guy who runs the, uh, uh, the cleaners in the building, I live in a building with a thousand apartments, so there's actually a, you know, a dry mm -hmm. cleaners there. And he said, uh, we will be closed today because I am, my Latino employees are, are all taking off on strike today. No, and he's, and I support them, and I'm shutting down. I'm not opening up as a result today? of this. Today? And I'm sorry, Thursday. Okay. Thursday. Okay. Uh, 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 as, we, as people watch it, it'll be, you know, we're, we're taping on Wednesday, but this is happening on Thursday. Mm -hmm. And he was showing solidarity with them. And, and I get that feeling more and more of people saying we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. and, and you got an issue, I'm with you. Right, uh, right. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's, that's very encouraging, yeah. very exciting. No, I, I, I think that multiple issues are coming together, you know, and where there have been um, differences on the left, you know, and I think we hold each other to very high standards in terms of, you know, many different issues that we're dealing with, but we're coming together with a sort of common threat. And we're getting organized. I think the key word there is organized. You know, we're forming the organizations, forming the coalitions, because to really be effective, we have to really come together. And I think um, you see this call with, uh, have you heard of the Indivisible Guide? Yes. That's floating yes. around out there. So uh, formal, former c congressional staffers have an indivisibleguide.org, mm -hmm. um, this guide on how to get organized all over America, not just in liberal centers, but, um, and there are lists of organizations actually on there that are forming to really start to go out there and put pressure, do bird dogging, try and get um, uh, in, in you know the faces of, of power all around America. And you do see this people right. going to town meetings mm -hmm. of their elected officials, and they're you know but right. they're they are talking about, and that's like what the Tea Party did while we were, you know. We elected Obama and then sort of stood aside and right. didn't stay active, and they got active, and now we're getting active. Um, uh, how did you all get act? Now you said this is your activation. This is your yeah, activation. But how did you get activated in the first place? The first place. And the, what first? Gonna make me Can tell you? my age. the origin <laughs> anyway, story. Well, I'll tell you in brief. Um, yeah, briefly. Uh, really, what really got me going was the assassination of Martin Luther King on April fourth, nineteen sixty-eight, and um, that fall there was a massive teacher strike. So that gave, it was my first year of high school and it gave me an opportunity to, to just hang out. And so that's what I did. I went to demonstrations, read stuff, and I didn't join the uh, organization and got involved in the anti-war movement, the anti-racist movement. So that's what inspired me. It was basically the death of Martin Luther King. And I was in college in 1974, right. relatively closeted, but uh, my boyfriend dumped me, so I finally went to a gay student <laughs> union meeting, which I wouldn't go to otherwise. And then I, and, I go, and then I go into the meeting, and they're sitting around and they're saying, well, we need to elect a new president, the guy's leaving, and no one would run because you had to put your name on it, and they were, everybody was pretty closeted in those days. Mm -hmm. And I just said, oh, I'll do it, I'll do it. And they said, oh, fine, you'd be the president. And that's how it got started for me. And then it's off to the races. Yeah. Um, in my case, uh, I was actually in the Peace Corps back in between 2006 and 2008 um, in Ukraine. Um, and uh, while I was there, I tested positive for HIV. Um, and I actually wanted to continue my service with them. Um, and then the Peace Corps, which is, of course, a U.S. government program founded by John F. Kennedy back in 1961, all about service. Um, my, my very own government discriminated against me and told me that I could not continue my service. Um, and so I was actually sent back to the U.S. against my will. Um, fortunately, the ACLU ended up uh, hearing about my story and helping me to challenge the Peace Corps. Uh, to change that policy, which was against the American Rehabilitation Act. Mm -hmm. um, and so actually had, had a very early policy victory um, in, in my activism, but that's sort of how, how I got activated and, and where a lot of my focus has been. And you can talk a little bit more about 
it was it just the Trump election that got you? Well, I, you know, I, I don't want to come off as as one of those people who was living in in this idyllic American dream and then oh no, how could we elect a fascist president? I, my whole reality is crumbling. You know, it's not it's not kind of a black and white thing. I I I'm reminded of an anecdote that. My friend, I, I think I can call him my friend, Ivan Maravik, who was uh, one of the primary organizers in the Otpor student re revolution to overthrow Milosevic. So he's someone I know from that school. And, and I talked to him about, I asked him this question when I was kind of still a, an artist living with artistic values rather than, and politically artistic, but artistic values. I asked him, how did you get involved in this? How did you become a leader? What happened? And, and he really told me that he was living his life as an art student, hanging out. And then um, when they got Milosevic, there really wasn't a moment of question. There wasn't there wasn't any doubt about whether he should do something about it. It was just such a such pure evil that he didn't change his perspective on the world or really have a big uh, night and day shift. He just started going to meetings. And when he told me that, that really it was really moving to me because I saw him as this kind of revolutionary leader and to think that he was just someone like me at one point was pretty mind-blowing and so I feel and I, I I feel I don't think I'm some great revolutionary leader but I think that the election of Trump was something that was totally unforgivable and yeah. Uh, pure and pure evil. America committed suicide yeah. was one of the headlines uh, there. But we're going to lose some stuff. I mean, they're already dismantling things already. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think back to the beginnings of the AIDS crisis. We had no help, so we formed services. We took care of each other. We educated each other about safe sex and things like that. We, you know, uh, nurtured each other when the government wouldn't fund anything. Uh, we even funded, you know, uh, Amfar had to get started to do research efforts and things like that in other groups. So uh, is that some of what's being talked about is, you know, we can't just die. We're going to take, are, are we going to do things beyond just protest what's going on and do things for each other? I think that's an interesting question because it's true. I mean, I remember back uh, when the AIDS crisis was first beginning. And I think um, that we have to not only, you know, well, first of all, we have to educate people. We have to emphasize that because we can't just have people just running down the street, you know, because they saw something on Facebook. Because, you know, we have to say in the 60s, you know, educate, organize, and mobilize, and, you know, and, and that order, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and we also have to build community and build community institutions and structures. Like yesterday, I was had lunch with Alexis and some. Um, we were talking about how uh, housing works got started. That's a group that uh, does it, it, housing it, for people it, with HIV AIDS. But it started as a committee and, and act up. Mm -hmm. And if you know how you know housing works. Right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Housing works is now like I mean I hate to use a the word, multi million, million dollar, dollar organization. organization. <laughs> It's like empire, really. Charles King's empire. Yeah. <laughs> and we were talking about, you know, and it's, it's, when you think about it, isn't that remarkable? I mean, it's big, isn't it's it as amazing. bigger than GMHC, I think? Well, uh, but, the, but the question is, we still have uh, lots of homeless well, people. We Do we right. even get our fair share right. of now? Right. I don't Absolutely. know if we get out, but we need to begin also to simultaneously build institutions or, you know, support groups of things to people. Uh, and I think that another function that is important to mention of, the, of these kind of su the support group aspect of the organizations is that I think that the role of the media, social media, Facebook, I is so problematic. And I think that obviously we wouldn't be where we are today if if uh, if it wasn't for the way Facebook changed al the algorithms in Facebook and interference and all that stuff. And I think that. It's really important that people aren't just getting their information from the internet. Right. And, yeah. and really important. And this is like, you know, I'm a millennial, so I feel authorized to speak about this. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm on my phone all day, and I, you know, I have that, I look at the screen, I freak out, I fall for fake news sometimes, <laughs> you know. And um, I, I do. I go, oh, can you believe? Sure. Oh, it's not, you know. It's so I'm one of those people, and I think that 
it's a, it's complicated. It's not too complicated, but obviously I think that we have to respect the legitimate media outlets. We have to, mm. if we can, pay for the New York Times and support journalists who do real work and so they can continue to be on the ground. But I also think it's really important that we're not just getting our news from the news and from social media, but from other people. We've always and found ways to communicate with each other, yeah. right. you know, whether yeah. it's by telephone. I mean, in the civil rights movement in Martin Luther King's day, they, they, the telephone had a lot to do with, you know, people being able to communicate yeah. with each in other. The and, machine. and we would fight to get coverage in the mainstream media. But how do we deal with the fact that people are in uh, information silos now? How do we break through that to get some common understanding of what is going on? How do we, yeah. I mean, that is a huge challenge for us as activists. Absolutely. I mean, I think, I think that is, you know, an essential question. Because, you know, a lot of people are really upset with middle America right now, you know, for helping to vote in Trump and not understanding. And, you know, I think about, you know, my family members who live in Colorado who, um, more than likely voted for Trump, and I haven't talked to them about it because I don't want to know, but, um, you know, and, and they live in these Fox News silos, you know, and uh, where there's been a multi-decade sort of, you know, pro uh, progression, uh, cultural progression, saying that all of these other news outlets are biased and you can't listen to them, you can only listen to Fox News. And I think one of the greatest questions we have to look at is how do we get them to turn off Fox News? How do we get people educated to go and, and watch multiple news sources to really question these media outlets? How do we target local media sources, local news, where a lot of people get their news from, and get them to responsibly cover uh, the news? And I, I don't have the answer right now, but I agree with you. I think it's an essential question. And we encourage people to make their own news and right. get, get it out there themselves. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes? Yeah, well, uh, I think, you know, your point, I don't, I haven't watched Fox News in, I don't know, how long. I check them out. You gotta uh, know what they're saying. But it is important that people, you know, read various, I try to read various newspapers. Yes. I subscribe to the Times, I'll admit to it. <laughs> <laughs> online, I have an online subscription. Mm -hmm. But it's also important, too, that people talk to each other. Yes. You know, not just through text messages and Facebook, but actually sit down and talk face to face with people. Yeah. And see, you know, to, just to check in, you know, the people who you're working with. You know, I work with a number of groups, and we periodically just get together and talk. Out, not about the work necessarily, but just what's going on in their world and in, in the world, right? Because it's some, so we keep that human dimension to it. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I worked on a boycott of Fire Island businesses a couple of years yes, ago. We yes. all, none of us uh -huh. met each other. We were all on this Facebook group, and we talked. Mm -hmm. We emailed chain, and I said, "Who are you?" I said, "Come to my house yeah. and let's meet each other." Absolutely. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, th that's something that we keep talking. About. I mean, you're going out into the trenches. You know, I think when people are disappointed about, you know, that Pantsuit Nation, for example, didn't turn into like a, a massive movement. It was right. a Facebook group, or you know, and I think it's because if you're only really seeing each other's cat videos you know on Facebook it's hard to like feel radical and go out there and have these important conversations and, and I also think that that you I've never had this may be showing my my closed-mindedness but I've rarely had my opinion changed by something that I read especially something that I read online in fact I, I will say quite confident that I've never had my opinion changed by something someone posted on the internet you know mm -hmm. and um, maybe some facts will change my mind but not someone's opinions but my opinions can be changed by face-to-face -face conversation and dialogue and I think that sometimes that's the best way to get through to people even if it seems like the slowest what are you most hopeful about stopping or changing? And are we going to make any advances in this period because of what we're doing? Big question. Well, that is a big question. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think, um, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I would say that what I am hopeful for, or at least the route that I want us to start looking at, really calling out the scandal about the ties of the Trump administration to the Kremlin. Yeah. I think, you know, the big win that we, we really need and that America deserves is for us to elevate this to a Watergate scandal, to really, um, you know, encourage and empower 
uh, the, the congressional Republicans who are bold enough to actually call for investigations on this and to aggressively, you know, and uh, you know, uphold their responsibility to the American people. Um, that's a direction that I really want to see us escalate because if we can uh, invalidate this this political this presidential administration, which already is invalid as far as I'm concerned. If you run on a platform of bigotry and racism, that is an invalid political stance. That but is it got bigotry. elected. It got him elected, but it is invalid. But I think that America deserves to have the entire election of 2016 called into question. Can we have point. a do-over? Well, I, th I think we I think we deserve one, and I think there's real proof that there there's some really. Uh, you know, sh shady stuff that has gone on, and I think we need to be looking at that aggressively. I'm looking at the line of succession, and it's nothing right. but bad Republicans. Right. It's bad, it's bad, it's true. But, you know, I, I, I think we need to escalate that as much as possible and, and it, it, try as much as possible to get as much of the cancer out as possible. Bannon, in particular, I think, is an important And figure. that's Stephen Miller. <laughs> no. And that's Stephen Miller. We need the <laughs> National Security Council. We need to get that back. The propaganda um, minister for the administration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think that, especially in regards to Bannon, I think that Bannon, it seems pretty clear, wants us in a state of chaos and his mm -hmm. whole I want to be Stalin thing. And uh, wh who's the philosophers he reads that talk about the fourth he turning? Wanted he wanted to be Lenin, he says. Does he want to be Lenin? Are you Lennon. sure? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think right. Stephen Miller Lennon. wants to be Stalin. I thought he, <laughs> I thought he said, <laughs> I said, I thought he no, said, said Stalin. He said he's okay. a into purging you are. Well, but. okay. Well, <laughs> Well, who knows? But what I but you know he he wants us to be in a state of chaos. He there's a lot of there's a lot invested in in the in the hope that we are going to run around with our heads cut off. And I think that yeah. it's really and this is I, I feel like I'm just repeating myself, but it really is important that we organize and that we have reliable structures, even in our just in our day to day lives. And I think that even if we can have some regularity and consistency and some structures in our organ in our organizing that's a huge win for us even if we're not making huge gains and we still have these this horrible oligarchy we need to find and that's it's hard for me to say because there's a you know a chaotic part of me i you know i'm starting a a punk band called excommunication that is only about it's a fake catholic punk band and it's only about excommunicating different members of the gop <laughs> so our first song is called excommunicate paul ryan and um, may you rise <laughs> as high as pussy riots yes, and thank yes, you yes, and, uh, but not end up in prison and yeah. that is something i worry right, about right, these right, laws yeah. they want to pass against protests the Absolutely. laws they want to pass again Terrifying. all over the country that could that they want to try to shut us down yeah. and when they get the terrorist attack yep. which everybody ought to be prepared for yeah. you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're down to our, our last few minutes any other words of hope for people who are living in small lot smaller places how they can do this well I think it's important for people to reach out to their neighbors and find out what their neighbors think and talk to them and form a group I mean even if it's just four of you uh, form a group and you know study and work together because I think that's how we build a movement okay. by having people organize. I, I, I completely agree and I would just say don't be afraid to talk to people who may you think might have different opinions than you yeah. do. Okay I'll try. <laughs> and and it, you, I mean it, Think about housing works and how it's yeah. grown. You know, don't don't underestimate yourself and what right. you're able to impact. And in particular, on local politics, on state politics, that is where we may okay. very well be able to have an impact, if not at the federal level. You can have an impact too. Thank you so much to this panel for being with Thank us. Thank you. And we will be back next week. I hope and we'll be back. Uh, this was <laughs> terrific. Thank you all very Great. much. Thank you so Thanks much for having you. us. Bye -bye. Thank yes. you. We'll do it again sometime soon. Yes.